Greetings, Rob Chastner here, continuing in our study of the Gospel of Matthew. And if you're following along, uh, we're in Matthew chapter 21, and we're covering the first 17 verses. Um, we come now to what's referred to as the triumphal uh, entry of Jesus Christ. Uh, this is the first time when Jesus has allowed his followers to publicly acknowledge who he is. Every time before, he would be helping people or doing these tremendous healing campaigns. Great enthusiasm began to build, and there would begin to be a big push publicly to acknowledge that Jesus is the promised Messiah, the King of Israel. And Jesus would quick, quickly shut that down and say something like, my time has not yet arrived. Now, for the first time, his time has arrived, and so now he's going to allow these thousands of people to publicly acknowledge him as the promised Messiah, the son of David. This is the Sunday before Passover. This is the event where we we get the idea of Palm Sunday. This is referred to as, as uh, Palm Sunday because uh, when he's making his entrance into Jerusalem, the masses of people are laying down palm branches uh, before him to uh, uh, to go over. The church has historically paganized this event because the church recognizes Palm Sunday as the Sunday before Easter. And of course, the Jews are not celebrating Easter Sunday. Uh, that was a holiday celebrated, uh, the, celebrating the fertility goddess by the Babylonians. In this event, the Jews are getting ready to celebrate the Passover. And so this is the Sunday before Passover, which means Jesus is going to be dead in about in, in four days from this time. Now, one of the reasons that there has been a lot of anti-Semitism throughout history in the church is because church people believe that Jesus killed their, uh, sorry, that the Jews killed their Jesus. Um, Yet we're going to find in the study that Matthew uh, describes these events, or as he describes them, this is not a chaotic murder scene. Christ has already gone on record in John saying, and this is John chapter 10, uh, verses 17 and 18, the reason the Father loves me is that I lay my life down. Uh, I lay down my life in order to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord, I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my father. So what we have here is a controlled, voluntary sacrificing of the Son of God. Jesus is calling the shots. There's nothing that is out of control, nothing uh, that has taken Jesus uh, here by surprise. Jesus is in charge of this entire event. All right, the verses, if you don't have your Bible, are in the box below the video. Uh, so press pause and read verse 1 and then come back. This is now taking place on the eastern slope of the Mount of Olives. If you were look, uh, to look at a photo standing on the Temple Mount and looking east out of the city of Jerusalem, you would see the Mount of Olives. In that photo, you would notice that there are sets of stones that are in a row. This is actually one of the most important cemeteries in, in the Orthodox Jewish community uh, for the whole world. And for 3,000 years, the Jews have been expecting the Messiah, their Messiah, to arrive on our planet. Um, they've, had made, they've made final arrangements when they die to have their remains buried on the side of this Mount of Olives because they believe the Messiah, when he comes, he's going to come out of the east the Mount of Olives is going to be split open, and it is there where all the resurrection from the dead is going to begin. And so if you were an Orthodox Jew of any notoriety or of any wealth, you would see to it that your remains would be placed in this prime location, because in their minds, this is where the resurrection would begin. And so now Jesus is on the other side of the Mount of Olives, and he says, to two unnamed disciples. All right, so now you want to read verses 2 and 3, so press pause and then please come back. All right, so you can already see the control of Jesus. He says, 
there's a mama donkey and there's a baby donkey tied up over there. I want you to go and bring them to me. And if anyone asks you what you're doing, tell them the master needs them. And so we see that Jesus is in complete control of this entire event. And so off the two disciples go to get the mama donkey and the baby donkey. All right, now press pause and read verses 4 through 11. 4 through 11. <clears throat> what we are to notice here is throughout the remainder of the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew continually repeats, these things were done in order to fulfill prophecy. Matthew is writing to the Jewish reader. Uh, <clears throat> he is writing with the idea that the reader is familiar with the Old Testament, and he's going to show the reader point by point that these events are nothing new. These were all prophesied in the Old Testament. Jesus is fulfilling two prophecies here in verses 4 through 11. First notice, he refers to Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 9, which says, Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout in triumph, daughter Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and victorious, humble and riding on the donkey, on a colt, uh, the foal of a donkey. And then he's also quoting from Psalm 118, verses 25 and 26, which says, Save us, we pray, O Lord. O Lord, we pray, give us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord, which matches verse 9 in this text. The entire scene is speaking of great humbleness, of great humility, because notice that Jesus is not riding on a donkey. Yeah, that would be bad enough, but... You're a king and you're riding uh, on a donkey. That would be embarrassing enough, but he's riding, you know, he's riding on the donkey's baby. All right. He's riding on a baby donkey. So can you imagine riding on a baby donkey and your feet might be scraping across the ground? This is a symbol of humility. Uh, and it was also fulfillment of prophecy. Now, as Jesus is coming down the mountain, Luke gives us this account in Luke chapter 19 and starting in verse 39, which says, Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, If you, even you, had only known on the day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your, your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. Jesus is telling these Pharisees, this is your day. This is your visitation. And Jesus is referring back all the way to Daniel chapter 9, where the prophet gave them the very day that the Messiah would be revealed to them. Any Jew during this time who knew the Bible should have been waiting outside the gates uh, of Jerusalem uh, that was the day the prophet Daniel said the Messiah would arrive. And so here in, is Christ coming over the hill and the city is not waiting for him. He stops and says, oh, Jerusalem, if you had only known what it would have meant to you, uh, had you opened your arms and embraced me as the Messiah, as your Messiah, what would it have meant? Well, it would have meant that the kingdom age would have begun and at, at on that time, but he says they were hidden from your eyes. It, uh, you know, and if that wasn't bad enough, look at verse 10 where it says, uh, when you had come into the city, that the city was moved. That word moved, the original word in Greek is the same word where we get in English the seismograph or seismography. In other words, there was a spiritual earthquake which was hitting the city and it was creating a ruckus. All right, press pause, read verse 12, and then come back. All right, during the first century, the temple has was constructed by Herod the Great. 
And although the Jews hated Herod, they appreciated his efforts, which he took in building this temple. Uh, this temple, uh, Herod employed a workforce of some 20,000 men for a 40-year period to build this on about a 16 or 17 acre parcel of land. And, and in, you know, imagine 16 acres filled and surrounded by two to three million people during the Feast of Passover. This space would have been very crowded. Uh, what happened was the temple, as in many churches and temples today, had been converted into a money-making business or a money-making scheme. The leadership of Israel was becoming fabulously wealthy, and they were manipulating sincere worshipers of God. And if I were to go to the temple, I was expected to offer some form of a blood sacrifice. And so let's say I lived 100 miles from the temple, and I made a pilgrimage for Passover. I could either bring one of my own animals and sacrifice uh, it there, but that would be a bit problematic for traveling for the animal. And so the leadership set up various posts in different cities to accept that animal for sacrifice. You would get a receipt for the animal, take it to Jerusalem, to the temple, and there uh, you would get a suitable animal in exchange for that receipt. Uh, but you had to make some kind of an additional payment of gold or silver or whatever the exchange was. The additional payment was due to the fact that the priesthood gained control of that livestock market in Jerusalem. And so they began to inflate the market of the animals uh, because there was no competition. They had the market, market uh, cornered. And so it might cost me uh, two of my animals at my hometown in exchange for one animal, for credit for one animal to sacrifice in Jerusalem. And if I attempted to get around this by bringing my own animal for sacrifice in Jerusalem, the priesthood would then inspect it. They had a requirement to be inspected. They would make some kind of a lame excuse and say this animal is not suitable to sacrifice to God, and they would require additional money to get a different animal that was kosher or appropriate uh, to uh, to sacrifice. And you can you can see that during the the three fe feast pilgrimages that the Jews were required to come back to Jerusalem, which is written about in Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 16. Uh, you can see the opportunity here for this underhanded business that the priests were doing, and it became this. This was a scheme that they became fabulously wealthy. Also, you would require you would be required to give a shekel. If you wanted to offer a shekel, uh, the priest would first examine the coin. It would have some kind of a graven image on the coin of a false god. They would say it's unacceptable, so you would have to take that shekel to one of the money changers to get a kosher coin uh, to give uh, as, a, as an offering. And they became very wealthy on that scheme as well. Uh, at the time of Jesus, the temple was referred to as, um, uh, as the bazaars of um, uh, Anis. Uh, uh, a derogatory term. Anis was the high priest from 6 AD to 15 AD. Uh, he uh, found himself in the position through a political decision made by the king of Syria. Anis was a bad guy from the very beginning. He was a street thug, a criminal, and he got tired of the functions of the high priest. And so in 16 AD, he turned that position over to his son Eliezer. Uh, uh, Eliezer kept that position for a couple of years. Uh, then he gave the position to Caiaphas uh, from 18 AD to 36 AD. Uh, we'll study about Caiaphas later in chapter 26 of Matthew when Jesus is brought before him for the trial. Um, uh, and then Jonathan, another son of Anis, uh, uh, to, uh, became the high priest in 37 AD. Then another son, Theophilus became uh, the high priest in 41 AD, then Matthias, son of Anis, uh, until 43 AD, and then Anis Jr. until 62 AD, and then finally Matthias, another Matthias, grandson of Anis, all the way up into 68 AD. So you understand that one family uh, is in charge of the entire temple complex for over six decades, and they became fabulously wealthy. And some of the historians 
uh, wrote uh, and estimated that Caiaphas had an annual income. This is back in the first century, $3 million a year. This was one family member's cut of the profits. You can imagine uh, when this nobody, so to speak, from, from Nazareth, Jesus comes waltzing into the temple and shuts down the moneymaker uh, operation, what, what that must have been like. So Jesus goes into the temple, he turns over this underhanded business going on, and notice that Jesus, what Jesus says now in verse 13. So press pause, read 13, and come back. The largest part of the Temple Mount was a large court area, and it was known as the Court of Gentiles, where the Gentiles would come in in order to experience some spiritual enlightenment with God, because uh, being so close to the Holy of Holies in the Temple. Notice that Jesus is quoting in verse 13 from the book of uh, Isaiah. Let's look at Isaiah chapter 56 and verse 7, which says, Even those I will bring my to my holy uh, mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be acceptable on my altar for my house will be called a house of prayer. And listen to this, for all the peoples. All the peoples means all nations. This was uh, for Jew and for Gentile alike. In other words, the temple was not just for the Jews. It was <coughs> It was for the entire world. Now imagine if you're a pagan, a Gentile, a non-believer, you come into the temple to find the one true God. Uh, you get into the court of Gentiles and what do you see? You see all of these high priests ripping off the Jews and becoming fabulously wealthy off of their schemes. What would you think? God designed the temple in the outer court for a place of meditation, a place of prayer, a place of contemplation, you know, where you can go and cry out to God, you know, are you real, God? Do you really care for me? Do you really exist? And uh, it was the court where unbelieving people in the world could get a true experience of God. But the family of Anise turned it into a den of thieves, a livestock pen and money changers. And uh, imagine how noisy and distracting this would have been for the non-believer coming in to a seeking an experience with God. And so Jesus goes in with righteous indignation. And uh, um, they're, uh, why is he angry? They're misrepresenting Jesus. Anise and his family took uh, an environment which was designed for the unbelieving world to experience God for the first time. Um, and he misrepresented it. Uh, he and his family did. And how many Romans can you imagine would have gone over those years, those 60 years, into the court of Gentiles, seeking an experience with God and looking and seeing what was going on and thinking, what a joke, you know, what a joke this is. Could we not say that this also is going on today in many of the churches? They're being controlled by one family uh, and an unbeliever comes into the church looking for God, but instead they're confronted with some kind of money-making scheme, and they walk away thinking God is not real. This is, this is a lesson on how or how not to behave uh, as we are being a witness for Jesus Christ. Um, now, another reason that um, uh, he was overturning the coin changers uh, was because this was the four days before Passover. And there's um, there's something that the Jews do for in the four days before Passover as they're, as they're inspecting the lamb. Uh, they're also cleaning their father's house of any of the leaven. In the context of this, leaven had the, the uh, meaning of, of sin. We know that leaven permeates uh, anything that it's envir in it, within its environment. And in this case, um, <clears throat> the reference to leaven has to do with sin. And so um, all throughout history, uh, they do this, what's called the Bedikat Chumetz. They rid their houses, their father's house of the, of the Chumetz, of the, of the uh, sin. And so what Jesus was doing, he was going into his father's house. He was getting rid of all the sin in his father's house in preparation for the Passover. 
Very interesting. Uh, notice now that after Jesus draws a firm line in the sand, he begins to show his divine power. All right, so you want to press pause and read verses 14 and 15 and then come back. <clears throat> Isn't it interesting? Uh, they saw the power of God. This was not a carnival act. They were seeing people with disease and infirmities coming to the court of Gentiles. Jesus is healing them instantly. And the enemies of the cross, in other words, the, the religious leaders, they're witnessing this firsthand, the healing power of God. And what is their reaction? They're indignant. They're bent out of shape. Why are they angry? They're angry for two things. Uh, uh, they're angry that broken lives are being made whole, and they're angry that young people are getting excited about God. Now understand that many of these thousands of people who are traveling with Jesus and are acknowledging him to be the son of David, the true Messiah, that they are very young. And so the, they label them as children. And so they're upset that broken lives are being, the religious leaders, that, that, that broken lives are being made whole and that young people are getting excited about the things of God. And those are the same two things that Satan will shut down himself. Satan hates humanity. Satan does not like to see broken lives being made whole. And Satan does not like children finding God. If you look at our culture today, you will see that it has been constructed in such a way to keep young people distracted from having a meaningful relationship with the living God. The reason why Satan does not want young people to get excited about the things of God is because there is something about the illogical thought patterns of youth and the naivete of the faith, the naive faith of youth that makes them so usable in the hands of God. All right, uh, press pause, read verse 16, and then come back. Jesus is really insulting these, uh, these Pharisees, these guys here. He says, have you never read? Well, Jesus knows that they've read the Old Testament. They're acting high and mighty in front of these commoners. They're acting like they know everything that there was to know in front of these common people, uh, these non-believers, um, uh, and they do that to manipulate people. Jesus is using a common saying, have you not read in order to send the message, you're stupid, all right? Uh, that colloquialism, if you will, have you not read, is an implication that you're uninformed or stupid back in this first century. Today, like most sincere uh, form of worship, um, you can you can typically find a, the most sincere form of worship in the children's ministry. You go down there to the children's ministry where you have kids that are three, four, five, six years old. Uh, they're innocent. Uh, they love Jesus unconditionally, and that is all they know. And there, uh, there, you know, Jesus is saying. Uh, God is perfecting praise through many young children. All right, if you would now press pause, read the final verse of this study, verse 17, then come back. <clears throat> and so now every night for the last four nights of Jesus's life, he'll be leaving Jerusalem, crossing over the Mount of Olives and staying in the town of Bethany. Do you not find it interesting that Jesus never stays overnight in Jerusalem. This is the location of his throne. This is the location where he will rule the world from. Uh, and if he were to stay anywhere, <clears throat> one would think he'd be staying overnight in Jerusalem. What's going on here is the Jewish leadership is not being honest. If you know, you and I don't like hanging around people who are not honest with us. You don't, you don't like hanging around people who say one thing about you uh, in your presence and do the opposite thing behind your back. Jesus didn't want to hang out with these people either. Uh, so he leaves and goes to Bethany where his friend Lazarus lives. Uh, Lazarus is the one whom uh, Jesus raised from the dead. And so likely he stayed 
and the family compound where Lazarus lived. What is the point of all this? Jesus goes to the temple, which is a place which represents the power, it represents the love, it represents the presence of God to the unbelieving world. It was not being represented that way, but rather it was a place of dishonor. It was a marketplace where you're being ripped off. It was a place of leaven. And as a result, Jesus turns over everything and gets rid of these thieves out of the temple, out of his father's house. Today, there are no holy spots, if you will, uh, in the world where God's presence dwells. Ever since 70 AD, when the, the, the temple was destroyed by, by uh, um, Titus and his legions, uh, that was reserved for the holy place in the temple. God's presence no longer dwells in brick and mortar, but rather God's presence dwells in the hearts of the living believers of the Lord Jesus Christ. Your body is a temple of the living God. Now, just as the temple was a place for God's presence, where, uh, where, where those who are searching for God could find a meaningful relationship with God, what is your life supposed to be? Your life is to be a living temple of God, that all of these lives that you are brushing up against that you encounter throughout the day, some of those lives are, being, are people who are in search of the true and living God. You are the temple where the presence of God lives. You should be able, as you develop relationships with other people, they should be able to see evidence of the reality of the authenticity of Christianity and if they do not see that in you, in your behavior, your speech, could it be that there's something in your life uh, or something in your priorities that needs to be overturned? As Christ went into the Jewish temple and began to overturn the activity which did not represent him, are there things in your life, things in my life, that the Spirit of God needs to come in and overturn in our lives in order that we might be a more effective witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. And if there are some things in your life that are affecting uh, your witness, go to the Lord in prayer and ask him to remove those things that are not of the Lord so that you can be a better witness for Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, I hope this has been helpful and informative. The next study will be continuing in chapter 21 of Matthew, and we'll cover verses 18 to 32. Again, I hope this has been helpful and informative. Thank you for viewing.